Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Awesome. Um, so thanks, guys, for the introduction, and uh, thank you for attending these talks. As I know, as guys said, you have a uh, you had already a lot of talk this week, so I hope I won't be the boring one that's going to uh, prevent you from going through other talks for the rest of your life. Anyway, before we start, um, as you can hear, I have a slight accent, so some of the words that I pronounce will sound pretty weird for you, so just to make sure we are clear today, I'm going to talk about this type of end, uh, not this type of end. Okay, everybody's okay? If I say something that sounds weird, just stop me. I'm used to it. The students always make fun of me uh, with that. <laughs> Okay, oh, this button, right. Okay, so we had Microsoft today, so you like computers and you like video games, I imagine. I, I love video games in particular. I love these video games called Civilization. You know Civilization? How many people know Civilization? Good, I don't have to explain what Civilization is. What I can explain, though, is why I'm talking about this today. It's because, you know, it's loosely based on history. And one of the things, actually, is pretty accurate is the way you succeed in this game. If you want to succeed in this game, you start from a small city-state, and from the city-states, you increase your uh, empire, and you grow up your empire, build cities, capture cities, etc., etc. And today, I'm going to try to explain to you how ants actually do the same thing, how you can play civilization with ants. And in particular, <coughs> something very interesting in ants and human beings is the way this you know, process of building your empire from a central state expanding, etc. is the same way ants actually build their own empire. So this is just a, a small nest of leaf cutter ants that you can find in uh, this one, I think, is Costa Rica. Uh, you have to imagine this nest at the beginning of the life of the colony was about as big as my pinky finger. Really, really small. Just a founder, queen, just came, diggled all, started the colony. The colony grew up, started to expand over the territory around, started to dig up in the ground, etc. And now this colony here is about 20 million individuals, so about roughly the size of New York City in terms of population. Uh, it's about 20 meter wide, 8 meter deep, pretty impressive. And <coughs> one of the other thing that, oh, that's just a video to show you, uh, like more with a 3D aspect effect. Uh, just for the story, uh, there's 10 tons of cement poured into this poor nest to be able to extract it from the ground without breaking it. Uh, of course, the 20 million ants are dead, as you can imagine. So this is from a great BBC documentary, because that's one of the things the BBC does great. Uh, all this hole here, this, all these balls here are chambers in which uh, these ants in particular grow a fungus. They do agriculture, so uh, they invented agriculture millions of their years be before us. So anyway, that's not, we're not here to talk about their awesome nest. I'm here to talk about different things. And back again to civilization. You know if you want to win in civilization, you need to have the best transportation system. You need to be able to move your soldiers as fast as possible to the periphery of your empire so you can defend your empire. And at the same time, you need to be able to bring all the goods and move all uh, your workers between the different parts of your empire if you want to have a chance to develop fast enough. And this problem that uh, the Roman Empire was very good at solving with their road system, well, the ants are also very good at solving it. And then today, I'm going to tell you the story of how they do it, uh, at least part of the story, because it's an ongoing research, as every research. There is uh, an exception to the way you build empires. And I should have asked you the question before, but this exception in human beings are the Mongols. If you know a bit of, a bit of history, you know the Mongols are were nomadic. Uh, people, and instead of having a central state, they will just go across uh, their lands and then attack different cities, submit them, and have them pay taxes and then move to the next city, etc. And they built the largest and most prosperous uh, human empire ever. And we have the same uh, exception in the ant world, which are called the army ants which are also nomadic and are also basically moving from place to place in the tropical forest uh, in Central and South America for these species. And they basically kill everything they find on their way. I'll show you some video of killing after if you, if you want. Because I know people like the killing. <laughs> anyway, 
as you can imagine, uh, if you're, uh, these are these army ants, and you can imagine that the uh, armies of Genghis Khan's look about the same. It's like huge amount of individuals crossing big lands. In this case of the army ants, when they're migrating, it can be up to two million individuals that are migrating all together across the forest. And once again, uh, we come back to this problem of organizing your traffic uh, and, and trying to organize the way you move across space in an efficient manner. I think that's where we see some killing at one point. Yeah, killing. So they can outpower things that are 100 times bigger than them. Right? It's not uncommon to see them killing uh, bigger arthropods or, or even some little vertebrates. I know it's sad. <laughs> But it's also sometimes awesome. Anyway, the big question that I've been working on and a lot of people have been working on uh, since the early 60s is how do these guys who have barely, you know, as many neurons as you probably have in your pinky finger, uh, can actually organize the traffic of millions and millions of individuals in an efficient manner while us with our roughly 90 billion neurons get stuck regularly on the freeway. I don't know how the situation is in, in the UK, but where I come from in New Jersey, uh, it's, <laughs> it's a nightmare. So the story begins with this guy. Um, have you heard of E.O. Wilson? Nobody has heard of E.O. Wilson. Two, three people. So E.O. Wilson is, is God. And uh, as everybody knows, God lives in Harvard, and that's God's office during my last uh, visit in Harvard. I, I, I hate this. I don't know her, but I hate her for sharing an office with Hugh Wilson. Uh, can we not record this? <laughs> but anyway, back in the, back in the uh, uh, late 50s, early uh, 60s, E.O. Wilson was very interested in understanding how ants coordinate their activities, in particular how they use chemicals and pheromones to coordinate their activities. And he was very interested in, in a pheromone that was, that's produced in this particular gland here called the Dufour's gland. And I, won't exp I will let the man explain to you or show you how this pheromone acts on the behavior of the ants. So it's a very simple experiment. You can do this in the woods around, the, around Cambridge. Uh, you put a little piece of paper, you give, so you should have like an ant nest entrance somewhere around here. You give them a little bit of food to keep them around. Then you put a little piece of food on the other side of a piece of paper and you see nothing happen. The ants are just busy uh, eating the previous piece of food. Then you use a little wood stick like this and you rub it against the abdomen of another ant. This will extract the pheromone out of the abdomen, out of these glands. And then you can use this to trace the simple lines using this chemical and immediately, as you can see, the ants are following uh, this trail. There's a famous experiment that he did back in the 60s where he traces his own name, and you can see the ants following E.O. Wilson on a piece of paper. Unfortunately, I don't have the video. Up. No. So that's how you do it uh, when you're a human being. Ants, the way they deposit this pheromone on the ground, this attractive pheromone, uh, it's simply by tapping the abdomen on the ground. You can see each time the ants moving this uh, slow motion video tapping on the ground, tapping on the ground. Each time the ants touch the ground with its abdomen, it's laying a little bit of pheromone. And as more and more ants are going to pass along this path, it's going to attract more and more ants to follow the same trail and so on, etc., etc. Okay? And just to show you how powerful this pheromone can become, uh, this, I'm going to show you a couple of videos. This is uh, this poor uh, YouTube user whose trash can has been attacked by... Uh, uh, colony of ants, and he decides to follow with his camera the trail of ants. He's still in the kitchen right now, but he's going to soon move out. Like, he's turning around. I don't know if you can see the three. So he's left the trash cans, go up the ceiling, the following the ceiling. The ants colony is going to come down here soon, and it goes on like this for about two minutes. And then you can cross the whole house, but... Uh, I won't show you the whole video. You can find it on YouTube pretty easily. Uh, another video, again from BBC, show you how intense the traffic generated by this pheromone can be. It is in the case of the leaf cutter ants, which are some of the most, you know, the big nest I showed you at the beginning. So these are built by these little guys here. And these little guys, they uh, go in the forest, cut little pieces of leaves or, or, or grass, and then bring them back to the nest to grow fungus on them. So they use the grass to grow the fungus and then they eat the fungus. 
And so they form this gigantic, gigantic traffic along this trail. It's, uh, it's pretty beautiful. You can see it from pretty far in the forest. Um, and I didn't put the music, but there's like a very military music on it normally. But I, didn't, I should have turned on the sun maybe next time. Anyway, you can see how much traffic you can generate with a little bit of chemicals and a little bit of uh, good odor. So anyway, if you're familiar with um, organizing traffic and, and people working on traffic organization, you know there's, there's three things basically you want to, uh, to be able to optimize in order to make uh, you know, your road trip uh, a dream instead of having a situation like this. So the first thing is how you organize the traffic itself. So how you organize the individuals on the road. The second one is how you organize the structure of the network, of your road network, because depending on how it's organized, it can, be, it can make the traffic much simpler. It can make things very complicated like this. And the last thing is you want to be able uh, to avoid to slow down. So you, if you have to cross a river, you're going to build a bridge. If you have to go through a mountain, you're going to dig a tunnel, etc. And I'm going to try to show you some uh, work that me and other people have done on these three different aspects of uh, traffic organization in ENDS. Is that okay? No questions so far? You like the ENDS? Awesome. Hmm? Okay, so number one, traffic organization. This is a piece of, you know, Kuya Nikatsi, the movie? You have to watch this movie, it's absolutely awesome. Uh, it's a movie about human activities in general and it's full of uh, time-lapse videos and also very slow motion videos, and a lot of them are, uh, look like this. So either of pedestrian moving in the streets of car, and this is Manhattan as you can recognize it. And as you can see, the way we organize the traffic in human beings is, there's two ways to organize the traffic. We can organize it in space by separating the different direction of the traffic, and we can organize it in time well, with this, uh, uh, you know, roll back the video, by alternating the direction of the traffic perpendicular to each other. So. Traffic is organized in space and time, so we're going to see how ants are actually doing it uh, in a way that's better than us, because if in human beings you start removing this nice traffic light that we have, this is what you easily uh, can come with, uh, especially if you have pedestrians and bikes and everything in the mix. Uh, this, I think, is somewhere in Vietnam, but I'm not completely sure. Anyway, oh, that's just to show you what, that's the usual um, New Jersey driver, uh, very friendly makes things better in the traffic, et cetera. It has nothing to do with the talk of today, just because I like to make fun of my, uh, my, my state, basically. Anyway, let's go back to the ants and look a bit how they do this. So we'll be back to this army ants that I showed you at the beginning, the Genghis Khan ants. And these ants, if you, uh, if you go in the forest, you, unfortunately or fortunately, you have to go to Panama and Costa Rica to study them. Uh, some people like it, some people don't. But I mean, tropical weather is always nice. And you look at their trails and you look at these ants moving on, on, and you track basically the position of these ants on the ground, you will see this type of pattern emerging. So the red ants that you can see here, it's an ant that is carrying a piece of food. Okay, it's coming from the battlefront, it's been killing a lot of things and bringing them back now toward the nest, uh, toward the colony. The black ants here are ants that are going toward the battlefront. So they're going from the left to the right of the screen, okay? And as you can see, some one of these black ants encounter one of the red ants, well, politely, the black ants say, you can go. You're loaded with you know, big charge. Please take my space. And if you imagine this is repeated along the trail millions of times by thousands and thousands of ants that bump into each other and gives way to the one that is carrying this big suitcase, very polite behavior. Well, this is the type of pattern you observe. All the ants that you're going to find in the center of the trail now are going to be ants carrying food. While well, all the ants are going to be on the outside of the trail, are going to be ants moving toward the battlefront. Okay, so just by being a little bit polite, okay, the ants form the lanes, manage to organize in space that traffic. So what we need to do is like physical barrier on the road. They can do it by just being a little bit polite. So I know you in British people are usually polite, so I'm pretty sure this happens a lot in your streets, but this is not the case in most of the U.S. Cannot, not talk, I'm going to be, they never let me go in the country when I come back. <laughs> anyway, what this person here, uh, Ian Cousin, so he was my uh, former advisor at Princeton, did, he took this uh, behavior and put it into a little uh, simple model of traffic behavior. 
and ends, and he looked at basically where are, are the ends very efficient? Are these rules of politeness something that makes the traffic extremely efficient? And in his model, basically what he looks is this weighing factor is basically how much polite you are. So if you're around this area, you're very polite, you, you're willing to give way to the other person. If you're here, you're a big jerk, basically. You don't like the other people. And this is how much you're likely to turn away. So how much you, you're polite, but at the same time, you're likely to go away from, uh, like very far from the path. And the ends that we're looking at are about here. And the colors and the eight of these represent the efficiency of the traffic. So basically our ends, they are most optimally, they are little rules of politeness, make the traffic almost optimal on that trail. Pretty impressive, remember, 250,000 neurons. And these guys are, are, are completely blind, I forgot to tell you that. They don't even see each other. Now let's move on to the second part. So we've seen how they organize in space and how it makes the traffic very efficient. Now let's look at a little experiment by Audrey Dussutour, who works at the University of Toulouse, where I, was, uh, where I did my PhD. She did this very simple experiment uh, with the black garden ants. So these ants, you can find them in your garden here in the UK. Um, and basically, the experiment is simple. It's going to come back. You have the nest of the ants here, and you have a food source. And the ants are given access to the food source through a little bridge like this. And there's a condition where the bridge is about 10 millimeter wide, and then the condition where the bridge is 3 millimeter, millimeter wide, okay? So it's like, it's like on the freeway, you remove two lanes out of three. Can you give me a guess of how, how many times the traffic is diminished on the, on the right video here? I remove two lanes out of three on the, on, the, on the freeway, how badly the traffic is affected? That's where you give me an answer. 25%. 25%. Do I have a better number? <laughs> Nobody? 10%. 10 uh, five. Just five. Two-third. Two so we have two-third, 25, and 10%. Zero percent. <laughs> there is no difference in the traffic, in the total traffic. The amount of food the ants are capable of bringing back to the nest. It changes in time. That's normal. That's because the colony gets fed, and so after time, there's less and less people out. But the Overall traffic is extremely similar. It's non, there's no statistical difference between the traffic on the 10 millimeter bridge and on the 3 millimeter bridge. Now let's go back to the video. Can someone try to explain what's happening here? Remember, we, we've seen now the organized traffic in space, so it must be something about organizing traffic in time. Yes, the hmm? They alternate. Very good. Yeah, if you look at the video carefully, you're going to see there's like a bunch of ants coming up. I'm going to wait again. So you have a bunch of ants coming, crossing the bridge, and at the same time, here you have an accumulation of ants. They're waiting to be able to go in. And as soon as the pressure, if you want, on this side is smaller, then another train of ants in your direction is going to be created. Okay? And if you look at how they alternate their behavior here, I don't know if I showed it. I think now, I didn't show the, sorry, I um, removed the result from the model, but it's very, very, very close to actually uh, an optimal distribution of the size of the train offense to maintain the highest traffic possible on this trail. So if they quantify the cost in terms of the average energy expenditure for ants to show that perhaps the ants are spending more energy somehow in the three millimeter situation? Not yet. <laughs> now, what they looked at is, is, uh, is uh, the, the model is very simple, is you have um, a probability to send three ends in one direction and the other, and you try to figure out what is the best distribution of the size of groups to maintain the highest traffic possible on the trail. So what, they, what the model show and give you is the distribution of the size of group, basically the, um, yeah. How would the ants, if the strip was really a lot wider, would the ants form two trails to get more throughput? If the bridge is a lot wider? Yeah. And how wide would it have to be? So it depends on the species. If we back to the uh, army ant species that we've uh, seen later, they will form these three trails. If you have like a lot of space, they will form these three trail systems. Uh, some ants, like the leaf cutter ants that we saw before, they actually seem to be looking for collisions. Uh, it seems weird, right? But it's because these ants, they don't need to be efficient at bringing back food to the nest. What they need to be efficient at is at bringing the best type of food. So when they collide with each other, they're actually getting information from the quality of the food they are working toward. So depending on the species and, and what they need to optimize to survive, uh, you will see the formation of lanes, or in contrary, you will see them almost trying to bump into each other voluntarily 
to increase the, the amount of information that's transferred along the trail. That sort of looks like what's happening in the 10 millimeter ones. They, they seem to be bunching up on the bridge. I mean, yeah. in principle, that must be suboptimal because they could do better than that. But they could do better than that. There's a whole like, traffic jam occurs. Oh, there's a lot of information exchange. They, they talk to each other of a talk. Uh, the exchange is so fluid. So this ends carry, uh, they, they feed on a on sweet solution and then they can exchange it with other guys. Uh, it's also a way to recruit and, and motivate other people to, uh, to forage, etc. So there's a, a lot more happening than just organizing the traffic here. They're also talking to each other and exchanging information. But if you put them in a situation where traffic becomes a constraint, then they switch to a sort of information is less important, let's try to optimize the traffic as much as possible. Okay, let's move to the second part, network structure. How do you build your roads to be as efficient as possible? So if you, uh, if you go in nature, uh, you have these ants here. Oh no, these one are the leaf cutter ants we saw later. So if you go to Panama or Costa Rica, if you go in the woods there and, f and find trails of wood ants, you will see that the wood ants, uh, they remove everything from the trail. They form these permanent highways. And so you can easily characterize the structure of the network they form because you just have to follow these highways that are very, very easily seen on the ground. So you can see them very well in the forest around uh, Cambridge, I'm pretty sure. And these were from Panama. But anyway, <coughs> and this is a, a, a small video I showed you uh, in the beginning, but I'm showing you on a larger screen because I think it's beautiful. But it's my personal opinion because it's my personal work. Uh, but it's uh, a video showing you the emergence of a network of trail in the Argentine ants, Linepitema humile. Argentine ants is these little guys, this invasive species in the, in the south of Europe. Uh, and these guys, if you put them in a circular arena, with the nest entrance being in the center, there's absolutely no food, nothing in the arena. They're just leaving the nest, and they're always permanently laying pheromone behind them. And so I don't know if you look at the beginning of the video, no pheromone in the environment, they sort of diffuse in the environment randomly. And then as soon as the pheromone kicks in, they start forming these very, very strong trails. Uh, so the, white, the whiter it is, the more ants are passing above these pixels. And obviously we're interested in trying to understand what are the characteristics of this type of networks and, and whether or not they form at random or whether or not there's some form of uh, structure in it. So these are ant trails measured by Jérôme Bull. These were in Sweden, but it's the same ant, the wood ants that you can find around, uh, around here too. And as you can see, they can span pretty large distances. The scale is here, so it's 10 meters, so it's about probably 100 or 200 meters here. Uh, some of them can connect multiple nests, and each of the black dots you see on this network is a tree uh, that uh, they forage at. So okay, each of the black dots is a resource. Now what we want to figure out is whether or not this network, they connect all these resources to the central nest in an efficient manner or just purely at random. And so to do that, John, oh, doesn't work anymore. Oh, I don't remember. Forget about this slide. Forgot to uh, remove it. What Jerome did is he, he measured the network of the ants and then he compared it to two extreme cases of networks. So I don't know if uh, you've done some network analysis here. I'm not very familiar with what everybody does here. But there's two extreme if you want, when you want to connect a central point to all the um, resources in the environment. One is what we call the Steiner network, which basically the minimum, the smallest network possible that will connect all the dots in your network. So it's, if you want the, the most, economic, em, most economical network you can possibly build, the cheapest one. And then you have the star network, which is the most expensive one you can build, but it's also the one that gives you access you can directly go from the nest to any resource straight. So you don't need to turn, you don't need to change direction, there's no bifurcation in your network, etc. Now what, what happens if we compare the end network to these two extreme type of network? Well the end network, if you look at the length, the total network length, so how expensive it is to build the end network, it is actually not that expensive compared to the cheapest one and much cheaper than the most expensive network to build. Yeah? model for some kind of difficulty factor for how you know how rough the terrain is or you know because these things can't shift a bit of bark or something that's getting in their way so so does that get you pretty does it mean the ant network is really close to the Steiner network? Uh, this hasn't been done for these studies but it's a very good question um, so most of the time what the ants do they really actually actively remove everything they find on their way so they, they shape they shape the environment so if you want over a long period of time, what's left of the network is uh, 
they, they can go some pretty rough terrain and remove everything from the rough terrain. They, they will cut all the, the grass, they will remove all the stones, whatever you find on the way. But you're right, uh, it's not taken into account. You can imagine you have like a, a rock here and force the end to go around. Uh, that we don't have the information in this study. That's a very good point. No. The ability to rewire. So the ant network grew from. So in this, away. yeah. So in this case, the uh, these networks are very stable in time. They are about the same every year. Mm -hmm. So from one year to another, they will reuse the same network. The reason is because they forage at very stable resources, so they don't need to rewire them very often. Uh, uh, so yeah. From chance at the, uh, at the start, a, a, an ant took a very if inefficient route to a resource. Would that be rewired over time to the, a more efficient route? We're going to see this maybe. Maybe I have something after that that might answer your question. Okay. But the answer is is yes. If uh, as long as they don't, they use only the pheromone. They don't dig up in the environment and don't move things from the environment. The pheromone is a very flexible system. In, in the Argentine ants, the pheromone evaporates after half hour. So you need a constant reinforcement with the pheromone. And so the trail are going to be very flexible. And now if we go back to uh, our three networks, and now we look at the question of how fast you can reach uh, a particular resource. So how many bifurcation, how many uh, decisions you have to make along your network before you can reach a particular resource. In the case of the Steiner network, you have a, what we call the root factor. So root factor is how many, how many bifurcations you have along the way to a particular point in your network. In this case, it's pretty low, actually, but it's a 1.4 root factor. So you have to have at least to make one decision, probably two, before you reach a, uh, a given resource. In the case of a star network, there's no decision. You just go directly. You just reach directly any resource you want. And in the case of the end network, you see you're closer to the star network than you are to root factor. So they're actually capable of building networks that both balance cost and efficiency in a way that's, uh, in my opinion, pretty impressive. Remember, 250,000 neuron. Your pinky finger is supposed to be smarter than them. Anyway, let's move on to the next part of this network structure, which is work that I've uh, carried during the last four or five years. If you look more attentively at the structure, the geometrical structure of the network, not the topological anymore, uh, anymore but the geometrical structure of the network, what you noticed on this trail is that if a net is moving, leaving the nest and moving toward the the periphery of the network, most of the bifurcation that it encounters are symmetrical. You have to turn the same amount toward the left and you have to turn toward the right. But the angle here is usually lower than 90 degrees, or not lower than 120 degrees, sorry, which means that on the way back, ants are more likely to encounter this type of asymmetrical bifurcation. So one of the, way, one of the paths is deviating less than the other, and in general, this path is the one that tends to go toward the nest. Okay? And this is something we find in uh, large number, I mean like six species, but they are from different, very different families. So it seems that's something that's generic behavior in most ants forming network. So trying to figure out what this does for the ants, we perform a simple studies. We let ants move along a trail with a bifurcation. In the case of the bifurcation being symmetrical, so when you move from the nest toward the periphery, the ants usually tend to choose left or right equally. They don't really care. On the contrary, if you move on an asymmetrical network, the ants coming from the periphery here, most of the ants are going to take the branch deviating less, so it's the one leading most directly toward the nest. Less of them are going to take this branch, and it's not represented here, but more of them are, are going to make a U-turn and come back and take this one. So if you want, the output here of the less br left branch is going to be much higher than the output of the right branch. Okay? This is like an advancement on standard alternate turning where you kind of take left and right equal numbers of times when you're foraging for something, yeah. but then when you find something, you turn sharply in one direction more often. It's like they're more likely to head back in a sharp angle when they have food in their mouths than when oh, they're... Oh, by sharp, you mean like a small angle, yeah. Yeah, yeah. more acute angles. And yeah, exactly. So basically when they have food, and one of the reasons also is they, they move faster, they try to run, faster to the nest, and so they, they, they don't stop at the bifurcation to try to think. So they will, they're going to take the path that's basically the least energy demanding, if you want. And if you plug this into a little model of foraging of ants, so you add the effect of the, you know, the pheromone, the reinforcement of the pheromone, the attractivity of the pheromone, plus this particular shape of the network, I'm not going to show you the detail of the model, but 
What you see here in this graph is what we call the foraging efficiency, which is basically how many ants go into this network, reach the food source, and manage to come back to the nest in time. This foraging efficiency increases extremely fast in the case of ants that have this limited, limited angular speed. So basically, they, they choose the path that deviate the less. While the ants that I don't, don't have a limited angular speed, they can turn as much as they want, as fast as they want, so they can take equally both paths, if you prefer. The foraging efficiency draw, uh, grew, grow very slowly in time, and it's just 15 minutes here. And after 15 minutes, you have already a three times, a three-fold increase in the foraging efficiency, just because your network is shaped this way. Now, the big question is, now we know that this network is shaped this way and improve, given an, an advantage for the ants in terms of foraging efficiency, how, how does this happen? So what we, to, do, to try to study this, what we've done is we took just an ant, put it into a little uh, foraging arena. There's no food again, absolutely nothing in this arena. And we just study the characteristic of the trajectory. Then we did the same thing, and we also studied, tra uh, studied the trajectory of the ants along a trail. So in this case, we put a little bit of pheromone along this uh, vertical axis, and we see how the ants is following the trail. From this, we extract a bunch of uh, rules of how the ants follow the trail and how the ants move without a trail. And we plug this into a little model, and then we look how the ants behaves as a function of the angle that you give it at the bifurcation. Okay, so that's model, that's not data. I don't have the result of the data yet. They are still in process, uh, being processed. But basically, what you see, the gray area is where the trail, the ferment trail is. This little gray, darker gray area is the bifurcation point, okay, where the two trails theoretically move away from each other, and the red, are average, traje average trajectories of ants, of simulated ants. Uh, so you have uh, thousands of trajectory here. As a function, and we're looking at this as a function of the opening of the sharpness, if you want, of the angle when the ants are coming. And as you can see, when the angle is very sharp, so I think he has like 20 degrees between them, not even, maybe 15, the ants tend to start deviating from the straight line after the bifurcation point. So if you want, they start to open the angle. They go from a sharper angle to a less sharp angle, to a widely open angle. On the other hand, if the angle is too wide, they tend to deviate before. And the reason why they tend to deviate before, in this case, it's again because of this limitation on their ability to turn. If you cannot turn faster than a certain speed, then there's some type of angle that you cannot follow sharply. And you have to start deviating, you have to start to anticipate your movement before you can actually adjust and follow the new trail. And the result here is again, a closing is on the contrary, a closing of the angle. And the stable angle is gonna be something around this 50 to 80 degrees that we have seen for most of the end species. So depending on how I place the constraints on the rotation of my ends, I can change the optimal angle for which the ends are, are following, uh, that the ends are following along the networks. And hence I can change the efficiency of the recruitment and the efficiency of the uh, foraging behavior. Clear? Any question about this? No? Just for your information, this thing has been done by a 15-year-old high school student, so if you're looking for someone to hire uh, in Cambridge or MIT, uh, this kid is absolutely amazing. He learned to program in R in two hours. Uh, give me a, when, he's done, when he's graduating, call me and I'll send it to you. Anyway, network structure is very important. We've seen at the end Basically, build networks that are both efficient, economic, cheap, and that also have a structured geometrical structure that improve and facilitate their movement. But now we're going to move to the part that I find the coolest, so I hope you like it too, because that's uh, my, my baby, is how we actually, how the ants are actually coping with obstacles along the, uh, along the way, in particular with gaps. So we know a bunch of things about insects. Social insects, they love to attach to each other and aggregate they form these sort of living architectures. So this is a... a Oops, I went too fast. I can't come back. Can I just ask a question on the yeah. structure? Uh, how about robustness under change? Are, are the networks they produce particularly robust to sort of <coughs> destruction of parts of the network in some way? Or? Um, so there, there hasn't been any study on trails, but there's been work on the network of galleries inside. And it's actually, it's actually pretty robust. In termites, uh, there's been a work published couple years ago now, uh, where they show that the structure of the termite nest 
Uh, basically, the inside of the terminus is very connected to each other, very robust to these connections, while the outside part is actually very easy to disconnect. So when an attack, when these termites are attacked by ants, they can cut a few links and they're completely isolated from the rest of the world while the movement inside the nest stay very, uh, move, uh, I mean, things can move very easily inside. So they, uh, they, they can actually adapt the structure of the network inside the nest in this case uh, to the type of constraints that life is you know, throwing at them. Does that answer your question? So anyway, let's go back to this living architecture. So these are a swarm of bees. You can see them during the summer uh, when they're trying to find a new nest. These are absolutely amazing ants, uh, weaver ants. They uh, form these chains to pull leaves together that they then attach with uh, silk produced by the larvae to form their nest. So they, form, they build a nest out of leaves and they form this chain to pull the leaves together. So it's pretty, pretty impressive coordinated behavior by animals that, again, have a very tiny brain. These are works done by uh, the group of David Hu at Georgia Tech. Uh, it's pretty amazing. These are um, fire ants. Find them in Florida in particular. Don't put your ants. They are the fire ants for reasons because it's extremely painful when they bite you. Uh, and these guys, if you put them into water, they form this raft. They attach to each other. They trap little bubbles of water and they form this raft uh, to survive flooding in their, uh, in their region. And you can see that these rafts have a very good flotability. Um, a recent study that they, uh, David published uh, recently showed that they also trap inside the structure of this, their, their larvae, and because the larvae have a lot of fat, so it increases the flotability of the system. So the larvae are at the bottom to increase the flotability of the system. Don't worry, nobody dies. Everybody survives. Uh, this one here is a raft composed of 8,000 ants, but in nature you can, you can find on YouTube a lot of videos of these guys forming bridges over water, and there's thousands, thousands of ants inside. So very, very impressive. Uh, but still not as impressive as, as my favorite ants ever. So back to the army ants from the beginning. Aceton Burchelli. This guy is absolutely awesome. I think yeah, I make a statement, a very strong test statement. It's the awesomest animal ever. Uh, so these ants, they um, basically mastered the art of living architecture, of attaching to each other to create structures out of their own bodies. And I have a few examples of this. Uh, this is, again, a video from the BBC. Apparently, that's the only channel doing good documentaries. Uh, this is the colony of ants called a bivouac. It's their temporary nest, if you want. And these can be up to 2 million individuals attached to each other, uh, probably in this case more around a million, on the side of a tree. And they all attach to other. And then you can see there is an internal structure. There are galleries inside. So they don't attach and just form a ball. They also create an internal structure where they keep the brood and the queen, etc., etc. So pretty, pretty impressive, pretty impressive animals. Um, and again, you see the swarm going out in the forest to kill whatever they can find on the way. And this big ball, every two or three weeks, moves to a new location. So this big ball disaggregates, moves to a new location, rebuild. Impressive? God, you're not easily impressed. <laughs> All the type of structure they form are less big, but but still as impressive, I think, in my case, are these uh, safety ramps, if you want, that they form along. That's the tree. The tree is going this way. Oh, this way, I don't remember. Oh. So this safety barrier basically helps uh, the ants climb along trees. They also protect if, uh, if they drop food. The food is get, get stuck into the safety barrier. So it's a way. So these this are all ants attached to each other and forming a little, little ramp for the other ants. Uh, it's very nice. They form also a bunch of other structures, uh, ladders, etc. But the one I'm going to talk about today, because that's the only one we can really study easily in the field, are these bridges that they form each time they have to cross a gap. So each time they find a hole, these guys, the natural behavior is like jump in the hole and then they stay there until there's no traffic anymore. If the hole is bigger, they're going to collaborate with each other and form this larger structure and you find dozens of them along the trail. So that's something that's very common behavior. And I have currently a postdoc in the field. They're trying to, uh, to see how long you can extend these bridges. The record so far has been 12 centimeters. So it's 12 centimeters, about 100 ants inside, all attached to each other to allow the other ants to move freely along the trail. So basically what they're trying to do here is, instead of removing the material from the forest, they're trying to smoothen out the forest by using their own bodies. They won't do this in New Jersey. They will just. Anyway, the reason why they can do this and they have these little hooks at the end of their legs that allow them to, uh, that have mechanism 
locking mechanism that allow them to actually stay attached like this without with minimum uh, energy expense. So these guys uh, being pulled down by maybe five or six different ends, completely extending attached to the tree is, is fine. It's no problem. It can stay like this for like several minutes. No problem. Anyway, let's go back to science. Enough with National Geographic. Uh, what we've done with Ian Cousin while I went to Princeton, we, uh, some of us went to Panama and looked along this trail to find these bridges and we called this bridge for about two minutes and then after two minutes, someone very brave uh, took a little tweezer and removed the bridge from the place and then what we observed for two minutes, how the ends, how fast the end reconstruct the structure and the dynamic of this reconstruction. And why it's very brave, it's simply because if you get attacked by these guys, this is, they can bite you and this is extremely painful. Uh, I mean, it's so strong of a bite that some Native American uh, use it as stitches, like perfectly organic stitches. So it's perfect if you're a hipster. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, you have videos on, online to tell you how to do this. It's very simple. Uh, take the ends, put it near the, 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 the wound. The ends will naturally bite and you press a little bit with your fingers to get the, the hooks inside even more and then you twist the body to kill the ends and then you have a natural stitch. Isn't that awesome? Nature, it works. Anyway, let's go back to our experiment. So we film them for two minutes, destroy the bridge, film against the construction for two minutes and this is what we see. So the first thing we looked is how fast the traffic on the trail, how much it was disturbed and how fast it recovered. And this is the time in second here. So this is before we destroy the bridge. We have traffic that's pretty intense, up to 60 ends per second. It's very, very intense traffic in some of the trails. And then we destroy the bridge, and then we look at how fast it recovers. And you can see that after only 30 seconds, we're back to normal. So 20 seconds, you, it's like imagine you, you remove the, you don't know the bridges in New York, I guess. What's the famous bridge here? Do you don't have famous bridges? OK. Hmm? London Bridge. The London Bridge. You remove the London Bridge, and then 20 seconds later, you can, you can, you can, you have a new bridge built. And this is the same thing, but we're looking now at the number of ants that are participating in the structure of the bridge, so the number of bricks, if you want. So we remove all the bricks, and after after this 30 seconds, what's in, what's very interesting is only 40% of the original ants are actually re, uh, started to rebuild the bridge. So only 40% of the ants is necessary to actually handle all this traffic. And then, little by little, the bridge is going to grow to go back to its normal size. It takes about 10 minutes to go back to this thing. And most of the ends that you see after that are actually ends that are on the side, and they actually are helpful to uh, sort of, like when you have an increase in traffic, they kind of sort of absorb this increase in traffic. Okay? We're going to see this in a second. So up. Now what we've done is, of course, we want to know how the ends do it, so we just look at their individual behavior. In particular, we looked at when an end crossed this gap, there is a probability to decide to become one of these bricks. And you can see that this probability decreases exponentially with what we call the packing fraction. So if you want how full the gap is. So if the gap is full, there's a lot of ants inside, the ants tend to just continue walking. They won't. Remember, they have this natural behavior. If you find a gap, they, they span it. So there's no more gap. There's no reason to span anything. We continue. When the gap is empty, they have a higher probability to just jump in it and form this bridge. Uh, you also have, uh, I don't show it here, but we have specialized ants. Some of the ants are more likely to do that than others. The tiny ants are more likely to actually jump and form this bridge. Now we look at the probability that they decide to leave the bridge, so they have been the brick for too long, they want to become an ant again. And this depends directly on the flow over the bridge. So if you have an intense traffic, the ants, you know, it grows exponentially. If you have a traffic that's very intense, basically the ants is going to stay forever inside the bridge. As long as there's traffic, the ants doesn't leave the bridge. We have recording up to 10 minutes or 500 seconds here, but we, uh, we stopped recording at 500 seconds because it's a tropical forest. Uh, the material doesn't really like humidity, so we have to stop regularly. Anyway, we take these two little rules. So if, you, if, there, is, uh, if there is a big gap, you jump in it, and if uh, you've been too long in the, if there's not enough traffic, you leave the gap. And we created this simple little model, it's very simple, the only equation I can understand. But basically, you have these two terms. One, that's the traffic along the trail, time the probability to join, and this probability to join, as we said, 
uh, decrease with the packing fraction, and then you have the uh, number of ants, number of bricks in your bridge, and the probability to leave, and that's a typo which will be decreased with the uh, amount of traffic. Okay, the probability to leave decreases with the amount of traffic. Very simple model. We can run the model and compare this to some experiments we've done, and we're very happy. The model is this uh, uh, dotted line. The red thing is the uh, confidence interval of the experiments. Everything's fine. We have a model that describes our, our, our system very simply and uh, very accurately. So just two simple rules, you get a bridge. But the next step we wanted to understand is, um, remember in the equation there is this term that depends on the traffic, and we wanted to know how stable is the traffic on the, on the, on the trail, because if the traffic is not stable, our model is not going to be stable, and bridges are going to be formed and destroyed very regularly, and in nature we don't see that. So what we did is we went back to the rainforest, and this time we filmed trails of ants to measure the traffic along this. Instead of uh, paying a bunch of undergrads to track the ants one by one, we just use uh, here a uh, particle velocimetry. I guess you're all familiar with this particle velocimetry. Yes, no? Yep. Everybody's sleeping. So particle velocimetry, basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a method to estimate the movement of pixel on an image. Okay? Instead of tracking the ants individually, we're tracking the movement of pixel in the image. And where there's movement of pixel, there's movement of ants. So it's a way to actually uh, very quickly estimate the traffic, the direction and intensity of the traffic without having to count individually or identify individually every ant in the picture. Uh, um, this trail here, we could have done it because it's not that, many, that much traffic, but we have traffic where we have say, 60 ants per second, so basically the whole trail is covered in ants everywhere and uh, students get depressed. So anyway, when you look at this traffic, well, what you see is what we feared that the traffic is actually very unstable. Uh, it evolve, it, it <coughs> changes uh, very strongly, uh, sometimes like dropping dramatically and re-increasing dramatically. And if you look at the, uh, if you do a little bit of, uh, of um, uh, frequency analysis on this, uh, you see that in general you have a frequency around 0 0.3 hertz. So every three seconds you have a peak and every three seconds you go down, etc. So you have this Alternate, uh, alternate, <coughs> alternating traffic. Uh, I'm not going to explain why. I, we can discuss this after if you want. There's a lot of theory, uh, strong mathematical theory to explain why whatever traffic you have, as soon as you reach a certain density of traffic, you have oscillations. Uh, that's just a natural thing. So anyway, what we did is we took our model again, and then we plugged in to the model. So in the end, we plugged in different version of the real traffic on the trail. So sometimes with large oscillations, sometimes with small oscillation, and with uh, in intensities and frequency that varies. And this is the resulting graph. So I'm going to explain quickly because it's not necessarily easy to understand. Along this axis, you have the intensity of the oscillation. So when you have 100, it means the traffic goes to 0 to max. OK, so sometimes it's 0, sometimes it's max. And the period here is, uh, well, you know what the period is. It's the distance between the, the peaks of the traffic, okay? So what you can see, the first thing you can see is as you increase the oscillation intensity, you go from yellow to red, and yellow means that the bridge is stable. You always have a bridge, you always have ants spanning the gap. And when you go to red, it means that the bridge is unstable. Uh, sometimes the bridge collapse, and then it need to be rebuilt, etc. And as we, we've seen, when the bridge collapses, there is a reduction in traffic efficiency, etc. So you want to avoid to be in this area. You like to be in this area. So as I said, if there's a lot of oscillations, very strong oscillations, you end up uh, going toward the red. Now, if you look at what happened along the oscillation period, not much except for a particular area of the oscillation period here, which happened to be very close to actually what you observe, what is the actual oscillation period of uh, the traffic on the trail. And for this particular oscillation period, I don't know if you see it very well, but the yellow, it's decreasing slower. Okay, so the bridge seems to be more stable for this particular type of oscillation, which is the type of oscillation we observe in uh, real uh, end traffic. So basically the ants have tuned these little rules of joining and leaving the bridge in a way that they, max, they, are, they form bridges that are maximally stable for the particular structure of the traffic. And I think that's it. I wanted to talk to you about on ants today, but my lab does a bunch of other stuff. So we ants, we've seen them a lot today. But we have started a big program on slime mold. Do you know slime mold? The most awesome organism ever after the ants. <laughs>
so we have uh, we study their uh, decision making processes and how they handle uh, unstable environment. Uh, done some bunch of work on collective robotics, how you have robots work together like the ants do. Uh, we've stopped that, but we're going to restart again this summer uh, in collaboration with Radhika Nakpal at Harvard. And then I have uh, some students working with Gareth on uh, trying to understand decision making in Angulates. And finally, I started a, a sort of side fund project on trying to model criminal activities in, in New York City because it's number 19th of the most dangerous city in the US. Uh, New Jersey is awesome. We have number two, number three, number 90s of the most dangerous city in the US in one of the smallest states possible. So, uh, hmm? and I think that was it. We, we love it. It's data. Or a criminal. Hmm? Or a criminal. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Program analysis, if you can. Sorry. It, it, for looking at formal program analysis, looking at whether proposed programs for explaining or proposed models for explaining particular foraging patterns in different ecological situations, slime mold, ants, maybe humans, whether you could prove that fundamentally they're doing the same computation. Yeah, or so fundamentally different computations. Along this line, we just uh, started with colleague in Sydney. Uh, we got a, a grant from the Australian Research Council, uh, not to study necessarily the foraging pattern, the tr the f but the, the, the way they uh, move uh, nutrients. So the, basically, the, the, the supply chains of the ants and of the slime mold, and we can, we worked with people in operation research there. Uh, that will help us basically characterize with the tool of a person research, so trying to figure out whether or not we are close to an optimal uh, type of chains and trying to find to, to detect the, uh, you know, the, the bottlenecks along these supply chains using their tool that they've developed for years on studying supply chain humans. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we're going to find that nature is doing a good job and so there's no bottlenecks. And then we can use this to uh, derive a new algorithm, to uh, new optimization algorithm like they did in the 90s with the end algorithm to optimize uh, uh, transfer of information on networks. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? I mean, there's no program specifically on what you say, but there is program on the part of this, which is a yeah, supply chain along the trails. Yeah, in all the <coughs> examples you gave, the ants can use local information to make their decisions, and it's nicely optimal. Um, are there examples of situations where the ants need to make different decisions in the same local situation and so need to be able to learn? Um, there's, I mean, ants can learn. Um, there's a, a lot of studies on this, on uh, trying to train ants. Uh, not necessarily the ants I work, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, it's my screensaver, like, to teach you a new word every day. Uh, luster. Is it, is it a nice word? Like once I had, I, had a, I had a weird word in class, like a vagina or something like this, and the students were freaked out. Um, anyway, um, so there's studies on ants and honeybees and a bunch of social insects, and they can learn a uh, different route. They can change. They can learn that the, the, the information of the trail is not good, for instance, that they, are, they, they know of location of a better food source. So in this case, they will balance the social information and their personal information and often favor the personal information. So they are, they are very flexible organisms in this sense. Uh, there's also a study that my postdoc is, uh, is trying to start right now on, uh, um, on the conflict between your personal work. So you meet another ant and the other ant tells you there's a very good food source somewhere and you follow these ants there. And then when you arrive, the food source is actually not as good. And we think that there is a, in this case, the ant, the, the recruited ant is going to say, okay, I'm going back and explore something else because you've, uh, you've lied to me if you want. So um, there, are, there are a bunch of mechanisms. The ants are not, if, if you use a purely pheromonal based system, the ants are going to be stuck into one decision. As you can imagine, they reinforce the trail and they stay reinforced. But they actually a lot of, they can learn from their experience. Uh, if the food source gets depleted or if the food source gets bad, etc., then they're going to stop laying the trail, the trail is going to evaporate, or they're going to start exploring and ignoring uh, any social information for, uh, for some time until they find something better. So yeah, uh, there's actually, uh, I think is uh, Brighton, Francis Ratnix does a lot of work on this and, and Nigel Franks uh, is in, I don't remember which university he is, but he's also in the UK and they worked a lot on, the, on this, how the ants learn from the environment, now with conflict with the social information and how they balance both type of information. I don't know if it is in answer your question. Yeah. 
It, it does, and I have many more, but um, <laughs> I'll ask one more. Um, so, are there other pheromones that they use for danger or for personal communication? Yeah. Learning or what? Yeah, I mean, the, there's a lot of viability in the pheromone. The pheromone they use for the trail, depending on the species, it's already very viable. Some species have only one component, some other have like 22 different chemical components inside. Uh, they have also pheromone that they use uh, differently for um, exploration and when they want to actually recruit to a particular food source. I mean, there's 14,000 species of ants. Not, not all of them use pheromone, but there's a huge diversity. There is alarm pheromone also uh, that they release in the air and that triggers their uh, attack behavior. Um, and there's some studies, though, uh, not everybody is convinced by the, the studies, but show that if they arrive at the food source and the food source is bad, they're going to lay a sort of stop pheromone along the way back to tell you, don't go there, it's not good. Um, and this is, I think, Nigel Franks who did that. Uh, though I might be wrong, it might be Francis. They're going to ask one of them, you will know which one. Uh, but the, yeah, so they, they can use different types of pheromone to signal different types of information. Um, you mentioned about the well, you spoke a lot about the idea of uh, using oscillations to uh, kind of share on a limited resource. Um, so this kind of idea has come up uh, recently in gene transcription as well, when you have different stress signals and they compete for RNA polymerase to, uh, to produce various different stress signals. Um, so I was wondering if the ants had kind of evolved to use a particular frequency of oscillation or whether it's kind of like a natural response to just the, oh, for the density. Thing? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm wondering so, also if so for the, the traffic, you have the same thing. Okay, so we can, we can speak about the, the traffic oscillations. Um, so basically there's um, a lot of literature, theoretical literature. Um, if you take a bunch of particles and have them move in the same direction or even opposite direction, as soon as you reach a, a density high enough, uh, oscillations are going to emerge and the frequency and amplitude of the oscillation depends uniquely of the density and the nature of the, the way the individuals move if you want. Um, so basically these oscillations, even if I don't have a formal proof, actually I, I've done the simulation to prove it but I never finished to analyze the data as always, uh, but it's likely that this particular form of oscillation is just due to the particular shape of the ants, the way they move, the way they uh, interact with each other along the trail. So basically they can't really escape the formation of oscillation and the particular type of oscillation they have. So it's more likely that they have evolved the rules um, to build, you know, this, when do they decide to jump and form, become a brick and how long they stay a brick to, uh, um, to, uh, to, uh, to accommodate this particular oscillation of that traffic. Does that answer your question? Yeah. The other question you asked? Well, so, so answer, you know, you social, and so it's clear why they would try to globally optimize yeah. some network. Yeah. Um, so how do all But human are not, so why do... <laughs> so that's the reason why we're so bad. Translate to, you know, non you social animals where they have some, you know, like, I'm not going to make a bridge with somebody else for three hours because I've got stuff to do, right? So... Is there, I mean, are there any commonalities going away from you social animals, or is it, is it a different ball game? Is that why traffic's so bad? In, in human beings? In humans, yeah. <laughs> well, no, it's clear that, I mean, again, there's a lot of uh, theoretical and even like, um, op, like experimental studies on traffic, car traffic in particular in human beings, especially in, in Germany. I don't know why they really they love this. In China, they love studying traffic. Um, and... Um, and basically, the, the, the reason why we have traffic jams is because people don't respect the rules. Um, and also because they don't move at the same speed. So you can have, if you have everybody moving at the same speed on the highway, you can pack a lot of cars on the highway. But as soon as one of these cars uh, slows down a little bit, then the car behind is going to slow down a little bit more to avoid crashing into the car. The car behind slows down a little bit more, etc. And so you have a, slowing, a wave of slowing down propagating backward. And sometimes several hundred meters behind, people are all stopped. So one car can completely, just because people decide to not move at the same speed. So the viability of the, the driver on the road uh, is enough to create traffic jams as soon as you reach this sort of critical density. There's like a, uh, some fun simulation online you can do where you have a, the traffic on, a, on sort of highway and then you can stop a car, just one of them, and then you see the, the, the traffic is stuck for hours for one car. Um, 
So maybe one day Microsoft or will come up with the Google car. Uh, and, uh, and then these problems are going to be solved. But as long as we keep driving fast and have a high viability on the speed we have, that's going to be a problem. And then, of course, if you add on this, they have uh, badly designed entrances that force the people that are already on the highway to slow down to let the people enter, then things cascade very quickly uh, as soon as you reach this critical density. Or if cloning becomes easy, we could just become new social and then we'd all uh, cooperate. To there's a lot of viability in the behavior of ants, more than you think. There's a like conflict in ant colonies. Some of the advantages seem to come from the fact that there's a sort of single colony and everyone's either going towards it or away from it. Sorry, I didn't. Sorry. Some of the advantages seem to come from the fact that there's a, that's usually a single colony and ants are always either going towards it or away from it, whereas yeah. humans have lots of starts and end points. Yeah, no, it's... it's, it's certain that the, the, the traffic on, on the road system in human beings is different because we don't necessarily go, as you said, like uh, in and out. But in ants, it's the same. They don't necessarily go always nest, outside, outside, nest. They, uh, they often like wander around, go explore, etc. So there's, there's more complexity in just this uh, back and forth trip between a particular resource and the nest. Uh, you, you have, uh, we have videos of the army ants. At the, they, they form a lot of bifurcation on that trail. And when you look at the, this bifurcation, there's a lot of sort of mess happening there. Uh, for whatever reason, the ants, there's a lot of mess there, but it doesn't cascade long, uh, away from the, uh, the bifurcation. So all the mess happening at the bifurcation stays there and doesn't propagate. So they don't, uh, well, one of the reasons is they can step on each other, so they don't really care about walking each other. The other thing is they can, if the traffic increases, uh, they can increase the side of their roads. Basically, they just move outside, which we cannot. But there's a... Um, I mean, in New York, if you try to take any of the tunnel in the morning, uh, normally it's like a three-way in, three-way out. In the morning, they're going to take one way on the least uh, used side and give it to the other one. So these systems can sort of be approximated also in human beings. But uh, yeah, ants are pretty good at uh, dealing with, uh, with these collisions and the mess they create when a lot of traffic arrives. But they, 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 it's much more messy than you think, or than I, I make, it, make you think it is. Um, but at the same time, it's messy, but it doesn't, the mess doesn't propagate very far. So then uh, the problems don't cascade, etc. Which it's not the case with us. One guy take the exit a bit, take the entrance a little bit too slow, and then cascade back uh, to London. I guess if cars could climb over each other, though, it wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> yeah, or if you had like flying cars and. Uh, <laughs> No, I mean, if we can use the 3D, then suddenly the, the, the space we could use to, uh, to drive, I mean, the, I don't think we could reach this density anytime soon. Uh, but um, that's not my job to create the flying cars. <laughs> you want to get on land, right? this double Nobel Prize winner guy, he's looked at um, the stepping stones that uh, you get on uh, the evolution of innovation so mm -hmm. that it makes it easier to. You, know, you see in the evolution of certain uh, innovations in different communities the same steps being being done. But when you can look over at another uh, society evolving, then you can sometimes circumvent some of the steps that they had to take and have a more efficient path to get the solution. So it makes me wonder about when we look at the same sol problem being solved in different um, parts of the evolutionary tree, from slime mold through ants to humans, to try and solve sometimes the same problem. It would be interesting to study the extent to which the, the things that have evolved along the way have prevented us or enabled us mm -hmm. to do the same solution more or less efficiently. So what is it that in what ants have evolved over slime molds allows them to more efficiently extract resource per unit time? Well, and is there something in humans that means that we do it less efficiently per unit time? Well, I mean, uh, if you look at just the aspect of sociality, I mean, something like guys... Um, touched a little bit before, the, the idea that ants, um, in the typical, stereotypical ant colony, you have a queen, and then um, that's the only way for the workers to sort of reproduce, they reproduce through the queen. Yeah. So they have to help the queen to produce new generation. So if you, if you have this sort of division of labor for the, the sexual reproduction, then um, it becomes very advantageous to, to live in a group, if you want. Um, human beings, on the other hand, we don't have this, and also historically, we've we come from small groups, 
evolutionarily speaking. You know, uh, the, this large population, this large cities, mm -hmm. is very recent. I mean, we were like before the First World War. There was like less than a billion individuals on Earth, and then like in a, in a century, we went from one or two billions to what? So nine, I heard. Uh, and so, basically, where we are now, between between the concentration of people in the cities, the use of all these new technologies that allow us to get information from. I mean, too much information at some point. We reach a point where our brains are designed to handle this type of information, this type of social um, interactions, and we have to sort of imagine the tools or the solutions, maybe inspired from nature, that can help us yes, actually sure. uh, actually deal with this. I mean, it's still you know, it's all the big pro the problem with big data and all these social networks. Right? How what do we do with all this data except selling commercials? Uh, you know, can we do something help more helpful than? Uh, I mean, I guess economy, if the economy is working, everybody's happy, I've heard, too. <laughs> I was going to ask a question about the size of the ants. Do, do, is behavior different in small ants in particular? Is their ability to turn and accelerate uh, must vary a lot between a very small ant and a large yeah. ant? And well, that, that's, that's a general law uh, of locomotion for all animals. Like, uh, if, you have a, if you have a long distance between your front and your back, uh, then it's harder to make big turn fast. Or if you have a large mass, I mean, an elephant cannot turn as fast as you because it's very large mass, so the inertia is extremely important. And it's also linked to the speed at which they can move. So it's, it's uh, small ants are more likely to be able to turn faster, but then at the same time they move slower. But does that affect the networks that they build and the techniques they use? Um, that I don't know. I mean, if, <coughs> if the models show that if they turn faster, or slower, then you get a different shape of your network. That's for sure. Uh, now, uh, what it seems is that most of the network groups of nature, at least in the six species where it's been measured, it's relatively homogeneous. So it's like between 50 and 80 degrees in average. Um, so the other thing is usually the big ants tend to move faster, oh no, the small ants tend to move faster relative to their small size. So basically you can have a sort of convergence of all the ants toward a particular maximum speed because they all move faster relative to their size. Uh, I mean, it's <coughs> because these guys, are, at this scale, they barely, have, they barely have any inertia, so they can accelerate very fast, and the smaller you are, the faster you can accelerate relative to your bo body size of food. I don't know. Does it answer your question? In the human, I mean, in the human car situation, you just had another extreme altogether. I mean, it's like, it's essentially a very, very different problem because of the inertia and acceleration involved. Just as Yeah, but for instance, in cars, you, you, uh, you want to design exits. So if a car is arriving at, uh, I don't know, 100, oh, 90 miles per hour, I don't know what's the limit here, uh, out on the highway, uh, if the, the, the exit is like super sharp, people are going to slow down while they're on the highway, and that's great problems. So if you want to create exit that people can take when they're go going that fast, Somehow, you can create other problems, and then you have to speak with the urban planner because they don't want the exit to arrive at the wrong place, I guess. But if you can design exit and entrances that allow people to merge or exit the traffic without forcing people behind to slow down, then that already should improve uh, a little bit. And if you go to New Jersey, it's a, we do exactly the contrary. So, no, you, you agree with me. It's <laughs> probably the, the, the worst world system in the developed world. All right, well, it's thanks a lot again. Thanks very much, everyone.